Hi, and welcome back to the Prickly Pear Show. I'm Ron Furman. It is so nice to have you back for our fourth show. We have two amazing guests today. One that's going to stay with us. We have Melissa Lansman in the house. Hello. Woo! Let's put, let's put that sound on. Let's put the sound on for people to clap. Um, we also have Vicky, and there you go. There it is. Uh, we got Vicky on the show. Um, Vicky is not uh, your typical guest that's going to be coming on to talk uh, about anything specific today when it comes to our topic. However, uh, there has been some sad news in the community, and uh, as a part of the work that we do around here at the Prickly Pear Show, what we try to do is to have a mitzvah corner where anytime we have an opportunity to help someone, uh, when they reach out to us, we give them the time. Uh, this has been a policy of ours since we first started, and we'd like to continue the tradition by helping out. So, Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, so this, this October, the 6th, specifically 2021. Uh, my father, Gaston Harouche, was diagnosed with a, a very rare blood disorder called amyloidosis. Um, it's categorized as a cancer and treated like one as well. Um, so currently he's undergoing chemotherapy um, and there, there is this one drug that the doctors recommended um, it was recently approved in Canada, um, approved in all, all around the world for many, many years, but recently in Canada. And so I thought, okay, you know, now it's great. There's this drug that can help him, can help save him, and, and we're good to go, except um, that's not the case. Unfortunately, uh, to get this drug, um, it's basically for the rich. If I don't think any middle class person can, can possibly afford this medication. Um, he's going to need 16 treatments, uh, and then it's it's one treat it's one injection, like uh, one injection per month for the following months until he goes into remission. So it could be like a year, two years, like we don't know, right? Um, and each injection is nine thousand um, and forty six dollars and sixty four cents. So each injection. Um, so that's about $144,000 for, for the first 16 treatments and then $9,000, sorry, $43.64 every month after that. Um, yeah, it's, it's really sad and it can increase his life um, by up to 54%. That's, that's, that's huge. And so imagine like just being diagnosed with this crazy disease and then saying okay there's a drug out there but you can't get it because it's so expensive like how how can how can we possibly live with that so currently um we have a gofundme page and it is help save my abba abba is dad in hebrew a b a and we've we've managed to raise um just over fifty thousand dollars so that's great it's it's a great start really and he's actually just started the treatment he started on friday and he's taking really well to it so i'm i'm really happy very happy for your family yeah thank you and uh i guess it's just important for me to tell everybody that you know i don't know why ohip doesn't cover it trillium there's no there's no funding for this specific medication and i've tried everything possible i've made thousands of calls literally to everywhere to the drug company to trillium to anywhere possible um, and I keep getting a closed door in my face and I just don't take it for an answer and yeah and so yeah you prepared uh, something small for us so we have a little video that we put together for your GoFundMe campaign Thank you. so Joe if you could just put the video on and just let us know when it's over and um, you know we'll finish off with hopefully somebody out there um, you know with a big pocket or people out there who can help out in some way you know when you save a life you save the world and uh, this is an opportunity, right? And that's why we're, we're creating this. And it's not yeah. just money, but it is money, unfortunately, at this moment in time. So yeah. we really hope you raise that money that you need. Yeah, thank you so of much. Of course. Thank Joe, you. you may hit it.
Um, I watched the video beforehand, so I didn't get a chance to watch it now. But uh, for anyone, again, that's uh, watching out there and is able to help in some way or capacity and help Vicky and her family get through this, really appreciate it. Vicky, uh, why don't you let the people know maybe where they can get the GoFundMe campaign, like where they can find it? Yep. I will I will post the link below. Um, again, if you just go into the GoFundMe and you can just click um, Help Save My ABBA, A-B-A. And anyway, I'll post it. I'll post it. So you'll see it. Beautiful. Well, um, on behalf of the show and I think both Thank of us want to wish your father all the best. And, and the uh, best to your family. Thank you so much. Yeah, we know. Thank so that's you. the thing. It's, it's not just a struggle for one person. It's a struggle for an entire family. So um, really is, yeah. we started the show dealing with mental health. And this is sort of a problem where you find yourself caring for other people. And uh, even though it's not about you, it's you fall into this trap of like, what do I do? And then. Yeah, we're in the fight together, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's probably harder on, on the family than it is on the patient and themselves. So. Right. Well, right. I'm sure he appreciates yeah. it too. And yeah. uh, really, best of luck to you and your family. We don't want to kick you off the show. Thank you so but much. But we're going to start. Thank you very much. You. And uh, <laughs> we're going to continue on. Thank you. Really, really hope uh, we make some nice changes here. Also, uh want to thank Melissa Lansman for being with us today. Uh, so much more room. We yeah, can move around. it's like a sad way to start off uh, the show. I know, but you know what? We're doing something positive. You are doing something good. And, uh, you know, just like the Prickly Pear Show, it's prickly on the outside, sweet on the inside. So let's kind of dive into it. it. Okay? Let's do it. Uh, but visit that link. Help Vicky yeah, out. Yes, please do. Um, Melissa, first off, it's such an honor to have you here. I'm, I'm so happy for you. Um, I have to be upfront, uh, and I think I told you too at the time that I did invite uh, Gary uh, uh, Goldstone. To Gladstone, come, yeah, Gladstone. Yeah. Sorry, I apologize, Gary Gladstone, to come to the show. I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, Gary first said yes, and then he said no. And I guess this ha happened after the elections. I don't know what the reason was, uh, but I just wanted to really get um, sort of um, an interview with regards to politics in Canada as a gen in general, because yeah. I think that many people who vote don't understand how the system really works. And having someone as close as you are to the community, uh, you know, it's a diamond, right? So it's like it's... I was uh, I was raised by this community. Exactly. Like I grew up in this community, and uh, this community builds up, you know, they, they are responsible for building up leaders. Uh, and sometimes, you know, those people get lucky enough, and they're humbled enough to be chosen by their own community to uh, to represent them in, par or in Parliament. And that's, that's where I am today. I think that... Um the way you the way you said it was such a mensch way to say it, you know, like in a nice way, because in reality, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, it's it's not just the community. It's about you working hard. And, you know, because I know you for so many years uh, from being uh, a UFT and, you know, working with uh, the Jewish community. And uh, I know that you were in politics when it came to school. You had a whole crew of people we even talked about in the back room. Uh, you're always involved and you always wanted to make a difference, a positive difference, uh, whether it was for the Jewish community, Israel, or whatever it may be. And now, of course, the city of Thornhill. Uh, what inspired you to really want to make that change, like to go out there and yeah, look, I, like you said, I've always been interested in it. And, and you know, when you say, you know, this is this is you, this is me and a whole lot of people that have always supported me. Right. A whole lot of people that had always trained me, that had always given me the time, um, that taught me how to uh, how to do it right and uh, and mobilize people around causes that uh, that you want changed. And so I started in politics really young, even before mm -hmm. we met. Um, I was 14 years old. I wasn't really that good at sports. Um, I didn't have very many hobbies. I walked into a campaign office and I was like instantly in love. Mm -hmm. um, this, these are the people that were going to change lives for the better. And they were going to, and they were going to do it through policy. And I got really interested really quickly. And that spark never went out. Did that change for you? Because a lot of people that get into politics, especially at the beginning, they tend to come in with sort of like, we're going to make these big changes and policies and all that. And then once they go in, it's mostly about keeping their chair, keeping the steak dinner, uh, more worried about their own family than what they stepped in there. Yeah, look, I think I think that happens to a lot of people in politics. I think everybody goes in for, for the right reasons. I think there's a lot of people that are still in politics today that are there for absolutely the right reasons and that are pushing their issues forward. And if you can find a couple things that you're passionate about, and I already have many, my, my problem is going to be hone in on, uh, on a few that is going to make the big difference. And you can stand up and you can be counted and you can say things that aren't popular, that are principled, I think... You're going to you're going to be OK in politics. Well, today, uh, the way, uh, you know, the city is working, I mean, the city, society is functioning these days. 
is where everything you say is is held up against you in a court of law sure. and nothing you could say, right? So it's sort of like cancel culture. So everyone's probably trying to cancel everything you want to say unless you run for office and they go, well, you don't like what I have to say, then vote for the other guy. But your job as a politician is probably to make everyone happy, right? Because you don't you, know. You're never going to be good at this if you're trying to make everybody happy. Okay. Right? So you, are, you, are, you are there to stand up on principle for the things that you believe in, to mm -hmm. represent your community. I've always said, this is not my seat in mm -hmm. Parliament. This is not Melissa Lansman's seat. Right. This is Thornhill's seat. And so you go there and you fight for the issues that matter to your constituents. And mm -hmm. if you're doing that every day, you're going to be okay. So, okay, fine. So let's talk about Thornhill. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a Thornhiller. My production company is called Thorn Films. <laughs> you know, went to Vaughn, like, you know, grew up and raised here. What is it that we want as a community? What are, like, maybe the top three things that Thornhill wants either to keep or change? So so Thornhill specifically, um, I think it's, it's much like a lot of the GTA. I think we, you know, we've talked about this before. I've talked about it. The cost of living today um, is increasing. You can, you can feel it. Uh, if you filled up your car, if you've gone to the grocery store, I mean, who hasn't? Uh, the, the housing prices, the cost of living, we are in a cost of living crisis. Yes. And that is no different in Thornhill than it is anywhere else in the GTA and in the greater Vancouver area and in any big city in this country. But it's worse here. It's, it's worse because we can't afford it. The prices and, are And you outrageous. can't live where you grew up and that's uh, you know that's a that's a huge problem I think we've got a transit problem we've got a we've got a government that's talked about building transit and I don't know what we, we grew up in Thornhill around the same uh, around the same time and I remember them promising a subway right like when I was a teenager I was you know mom you're never gonna have to drive me to Finch station I'm right. going to take the subway from from Clark still not a shovel in the ground I might take it. We might take it to our retirement party. Right. So we've got to get. Well, we're going to take that in Eng Eglinton too. Right? Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, right? maybe we'll we'll have a we'll have a retirement party somewhere on the uh, on the uh, on the young line and making sure that it's a route that makes sense and not digging under people's houses and there's all kinds of issues there. I think there is, you know, you you, it would I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there is a large Jewish community, one that I'm from, one that built me up, one that you're from. Right. Uh, and time and time again, and we knocked on 75,000 doors yeah. in the span of, uh, of a couple months. Uh, and every day, any given day, we talked about the rise in anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. People talked to me about how fearful they were about being a Jew in this country. Um, and going to Parliament and understanding the community that I come from and what I believe in, uh, that we have to eradicate this. By the way, last week's uh, show dealt exactly with that. Uh, but I want to ask you... Uh, we don't just have Jewish people living in Thornhill. I mean, yes, sure. uh, I mean by the numbers that I remember, I think it was fifty-two percent Jewish people in Thornhill. It's a little, it's a little huge. lower than that. A little which, lower, which means, which means there is, you know, a well, large percentage of other. Right, and other. And did you uh, receive backlash from the other? Did they feel that they weren't being represented in some way? No, I think, look, we have a very diverse campaign team. We have a very diverse, uh, um, you know, uh, campaign plan to be able to talk to all of those communities. We've got a large, we've got large cultural communities in Thornhill. And, and if you, you know, if you walked around and if you went to the mall, you, you would see there's a large Filipino community. You know, there's a, there, frankly, there's just a large non-Jewish community. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that there's still a cost of living crisis in those communities. Right, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, for, for, for our friends in the Filipino community, of which there are 5,000 plus in, uh, in Thornhill, you know, they've been on the front lines of this. Mm. Um, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're talking to me about I issues on immigration. It would be, you would be surprised to know that we are, we are one of the constituencies in Canada that have the largest number of immigration cases coming into our office which means people want to come here. People right. want to live here. People want to reunite with their families. People want to raise a family in Thornhill. It's a great community. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, it's a growing community, and it's growing in terms of diversification, too. You mentioned something about Thornhill specifically with the housing market. And yeah. what we're looking at, you know, you, you said that there's no way that I can live in the place where I grew sure. up because it's ridiculously expensive. I think when we spoke in the green room, you mentioned something about being in Sutton, right? But the problem is, is that we... We work in the city, so Thornhill yeah. is already outside of the city. For so sure. you're adding another hour of driving. Yeah, the commute times are are yeah. are already um, you know right. already busy. And I mean, uh, speaking of construction with those subway, I mean, even uh, the roads are are barely being built. Like we're having many issues. You know, if let's just say they close down one highway, that's it. You're, you know, you're spending another hour and a half right. trying to detour around it. So my question is, like, what do you see for the next generation, the next ten years or twenty years? 
if we can't afford to live there, I mean, who will be taking over? Yeah, look, we've got to, I mean, in terms of in terms of who's going to take over, I think we've got to fix the housing cri- crisis. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that I am there for. I think we need to build more. We need to stop printing money. These, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're suffering from the largest inflation that we've had in certainly in our lifetime. Right. Except for, you know, when your parents... When your parents bought that first house in Thornhill, probably at somewhere between a hundred and a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. A lot more, but yes. Uh, well, it, in, in thirty years ago, when yeah. many of the houses were built, that was around the right. price. You couldn't even think about doing. It. You can't even buy a parking spot um, for for that amount of money. And, right. and what this does is actually bigger than just you know you can't buy a house. What it does is it tears our community apart. It tears families apart. You know, I, I make the example of Sutton because it sounds very far to me. Um, but, you know, living there or even living in Newmarket or even living past Newmarket, you know, mom and dad aren't going to see the grandkids all that much. Right. There isn't, you know, there isn't the community, there isn't the community structure that you grew up in that erodes our tradition, it erodes our families. Uh, and something as simple as a housing crisis and the housing price and our inability to afford a place where we lived actually has detrimental effects on the way that we live our lives and the family unit in this uh, in this country. So we've got to fix that. We've got to build more supply. Well, along with that is uh, COVID uh, hurt us a little bit, right? Sure. Uh, and, you know, right now there's a lot of businesses that are going out of business. I, I walked into the Promenade Mall, you know, our mall not long ago, and I noticed how many stores were closed. Yep. Uh, Sobeys in our neighborhood on Rutherford and, and Bathurst closed down. Uh, people like myself, you know, sure. who, are, who are struggling. And so where do you see, again, the next generation? Where do you see them realistically moving to or, or getting through this? How do you see them getting through this? I don't I, like I love to hear that, like, OK, great. You know, we, we're going to get more housing and we're not going to print as many dollars. But the bottom line is. Uh, we still have to survive. Yeah, we are. Look, and and I think much of that was uh, a response to an immediate crisis. When we, you know, global pandemic, we've never lived right. through one um, before. There was supports where there needed to be supports, but at some point, we need to we need to kickstart the economy. We need to bring jobs back. I think I was speaking to the uh, um, the the Canadian business. Uh, it wasn't the Canadian Business Council, the CFIB, the, um, they're the small businesses. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, the, the, the labor shortage that we have, and we do have one, is, is, is one of the big issues. If people can't find, you know, anybody to, to work, the, they're still receiving the benefit at home. That's one of the things that I hear from, uh, from businesses. Um, but it's the cost of doing business in this country that has just gone up. We've got a shipping crisis. Uh, I know that, you know, many of your viewers and many of your listeners would have gone to, to the mall recently mm-hmm. uh and you know on top of it if they if they have the 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 ability to sort of buy something new buy something nice for themselves there are no sizes they don't know when they're coming next uh there is no uh there's no supply and the prices have all gone up right uh and our paychecks haven't and so <laughs> we are we That's are continuing huge, to print we are continuing to print dollars and as a result your purchasing power yes. the amount of money that you spend on the same thing yep. goes less and less uh, and we talked about this, uh, you know, this issue where they're actually just putting less product in, right? right? Like uh, the the dog food it might go down twenty five cents, but it goes down in terms of volume by half. Well, who's held? Who's holding them accountable for all this? Because well, this is this is this is the thing. That's so really we'll, the reality. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about this. And you know, I was elected in in Thornhill as the member for Thornhill. I was elected as part of the Conservative Party. We unfortunately did not win government, um, and uh, we have some work to do on 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 that front. But we're going to hold this government to account. Um, and we've got to hold this government to account on their, you know, on particularly this issue, on the cost of living, on getting the economy kickstarted. We can talk about COVID until the cows come home. And the right. one thing about COVID is that COVID is always changing. Right. But what we need to do is start getting people back to work uh, and start uh, stop printing money, more paychecks and less debt in this country. Uh, you, you mentioned we mentioned a little bit about Corona. We mentioned a little bit about the you know the housing market and of course jobs. But let's talk a little bit about vaccinations. And yeah. it's a topic where you know I'm vaccinated and sure. I'm not anti. I'm not pro. I, I don't really have an opinion on it, except for maybe one. I feel people should have the right to do whatever they want with their own bodies, just like I feel about a lot of things. Uh, but right now you mentioned that uh, we're we need labor. Yeah. But at the same time, they're getting rid of really good workers sure. because. They don't want to be vaccinated. And, you know, what's going to happen with them? I mean, the housing market is not going to change, as you said. Uh, they now cannot pay the bills. You, There might be a small revolution uh, if enough people are out there out of work uh, and they believe in one thing. 
you know, it starts with small and it can become something huge. Yeah, look, I think we're playing a very dangerous game in this country on uh, on vaccinations. I'm 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 like you. I, I do believe that vaccines are are the end to to this. Um, you know, I, I'd go as far as I'm I'm pro vaccine, but I also believe that people should be able to make their own health choices, and that's you know that's no different than on anything else in right. in, in this country. Uh, I do have a problem with people being fired um, for, uh, you know, for, for, for the choice that they've made. And I think that we'll see this exacerbated in, in, in the context of when we're talking about vaccinations for kids. Right now, we have a large percentage of the of population, particularly in Ontario. We're, we're inching up to 90% that are, uh, that are vaccinated. Um, so there's the 10% that aren't. But rather than demonizing those 10%, right. calling them names, calling them anti-vaxxers, there is a hesitancy there that mm -hmm. we need to understand. And if you say, you know, you're wrong and you're fired and you're lesser and you're bad, uh, I think that's a really, really big problem in society. And I don't want to be a part of that as a politician. We're seeing that there's a serious divide in sure. many, many things across the board. And I was looking at, uh, you know, like sort of what people vote on. And I realized that w when I did the little test, I did one of those tests where you kind of, where do you belong? Yeah. Uh, weirdly enough, I was Green Party. <laughs> I mean, with a lot of my opinions. All right. I, 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 don't, I don't see myself as that. But, you know, I just saw myself sort of belonging to many, many different things. And the reason I bring this up is because if you're somebody that supports Israel or supports, you know, uh, helping the economy, yep. but there's other things that you don't support, how do you get yourself to vote conservative or liberal? How do you find, where does one find sort of his spot? What is more important to them? Because when I was looking at the PPC, when people were talking about them, you know, they had a big, because of the vaccines, they sure. got a, a little bit of a big push. Uh, I said, what else do they stand for? And I wasn't getting too many answers. And nobody was, answered the question. Nobody answered the questions. Right. And I said, you are the one that's voting for them. What else are they, what's their platform? And people had no idea what their platform was. It was just dealing with the vaccines. Right. So sort of like what happens if there are so many things that you believe in, but yet one party represents just something really big in your life? Should that be Look, your I way think of, your reason I, I think for voting? Different, I think there's different pe people vote in a different way. Sometimes there's issue voters. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, if it was, you know, if that was the thing that was on their mind, the thing that they were voting for, if it was vaccines, then sure. Uh, they voted for uh, for the PPC because they felt that uh, that the PPC would would stand up for the thing that they cared about most in their lives. Um, I think that there are people who vote for the local politician, somebody who is going to serve their community well, somebody who is you know a long time uh, you know member of the community, somebody that you can be proud of sending to Ottawa or to Queens Park mm -hmm. or to to wherever level of government you elect them to. I think there's some people that vote with uh, with the party, and for me, this was never a question. As a as a as a Jewish kid growing up in a Zionist family in uh, in Thornhill, there was never a question about which party stood for me. That was the most important issue uh, to me. And it turns out that uh, that there are a lot of other issues, and I think that there are there are a myriad of views in the Conservative Party. There are a myriad of views in the Liberal Party, but for the most part. Uh, I can get behind a conservative vision for this country because I think that we're in better hands when the country is governed by conservatives. I, I love that you said that, but I want to know why is that? Uh, and and I'll, I'll expand that a little bit on it. It's like, why wouldn't the liberal government be pro-Israel? Don't we share the same values? Why isn't liberal government, uh, you know, supporting you know, what's happening down there, like the two-state solution, like being sort of an advocate as opposed to uh, picking a side? Why can't, you know, most Canadians in power, like I'll give an example, when the conservatives are pro-Israel, then you have the NDP going the exact opposite. Right. So it's almost like they're trying to feed to the people that are voting for them as opposed to going on principle. And then do they actually believe that Israel is this terrorist state? So I want to know why is it that there's only one party in Canada that supports Israel? Well, look, I think the the liberals would argue that they support Israel too, but I think one is, you know, one is lip service to to the cause saying, you know, we support something or uh, you know, we're for this, we're against that. Uh, and then there is the party that when nobody is on the side of Israel. When, you know, when when people at at a conference called the Francophonie all disparage uh, Israel, or when the UN decides, you know, the 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 place of of that is home to the despots and the dictators, when they decide to single out Israel, there is one government and one country uh, back six years ago that stood up and that stood up when it was principled, 
and not necessarily popular. So and they did it every single time. We had a, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, you know, Peter Kent a little mm-hmm. bit. Because mm-hmm. he's, he's the guy that I replaced in this mm-hmm. community. And he is, he is not from our community. Right. Right? He was not raised by this community. He mm-hmm. was not raised in a Zionist household. Well, mm-hmm. maybe he was, but no, not, not like my Betar father. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, and, and he never wavered. Not once. When the community asked him for something, because he believed in it. He believed that that was the right thing to do. And when we have people like that on our side, when we have people like Peter Kent and Stephen Harper and guys who always did the right thing, even when it wasn't popular, that's what makes this party better than any other party on this issue. So what's wrong with our delivery to let people know this? Because um, it's, it seems to me that uh, people think that uh, the Conservative Party is sort of like, you know, they have three different issues that they deal with. They always have to support Israel. They have to support the rich. You know, they have to be anti-gay, uh, which is something we're going to talk, yeah, a little talk bit about. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, like, beautiful. <laughs> uh, you're a member of the LGBT community. I am. And um, being a conservative, uh, some may say that it's a little bit of an oxymoron. Look, I, th- <laughs> I think I think on every issue, there is you're never going to find a hundred percent agreement with uh, with every party. Mm-hmm. Um, but on this one, I feel super comfortable. Um, I feel that we have a you know we have a leader um, that doesn't care you know who you're married to, uh, you know if you're married, if you're not married at all, if you're married to a boy or a girl or or, or you know someone in between or or nothing at all. If you you know it doesn't matter if you pray on Friday or Saturday or Sunday or not at all. You have a home in the Conservative Party. And I think there's a lot of hearts and minds still to win on some of the issues around LGBT rights, particularly on, on trans rights. But if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, we would be talking about marriage equality. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about that anymore. Because there's a lot of work done to get people on board with it doesn't matter who you marry. Right. We want strong families. We want a strong family unit because the, be- the country is better off when families are strong. And we don't care what those families look like. And it doesn't matter who you are, you have a place in the Conservative Party. That's what I represent. And that's the party that I want to be part of. And I think that's the party that we're moving towards. Uh, and it's better, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this on air, it's better to piss inside the tent than outside of it. Absolutely. But I, I want to know, how has the LGBT community seen you? Because I'm sure that uh, there has been some, you know, words... Uh, said sure. towards you like a uh, traitor or like how could you be su- yeah. how could you support this I uh, think in the same way as you just described we want every party to be pro-Israel and pro-Zionist mm-hmm. and I think that there are many in the LGBT community that want this issue put to bed all issues around LGBT rights and look we're the party that uh, that is talking about the blood ban right the blood ban on 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 gay men to, yeah. br- to bring that's the conservative party and if you ask somebody who's the party that is behind that and you told them that was the conservative party, they wouldn't believe you. Absolutely. Things are changing. Um, and things are changing uh, certainly with, uh, uh, with, 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 with the party, with members of the party. I'm not the only LGBT member uh, elected in my party. I hope that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of the first and not one of the last. Uh, what about thoughts uh, when it comes to what they teach at schools? It's, it's something big that people ask me on a regular basis. Uh, with regards to you know talking about two moms and two dads in school, you know, they, at our, as as young as eight years old, uh, language has to change. Um, are you hearing anything about that? Like, is there? Yeah, look, I'm I'm so I'm on the federal level, and I don't I don't talk a lot about uh, the the education curriculum mm-hmm. that uh, that falls on uh, on my friend uh, Stephen Lecce, who is our who is this this province's um, minister. Um, but I think you know I think language. I think language always changes, and I think that there is a responsible way to bring that into a curriculum. I do think there is an age that is uh, that is too young. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not the one making those decisions. I don't know if it's eight. I don't know if it's nine. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's ten. Um, but I do know that uh, that that we teach issues all the time. For instance, I know we are going to start teaching more about, you know, indigenous kids who are found uh, in in grave sites. I don't know if. Uh, if the if the right age is 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 five or six or seven or eight, um, but I know that there are uh, you know I know that there are a lot of conversations when it comes to a curriculum and how to teach something that is age appropriate, um, you know, to kids in a world where they're going to have to face this and they're going to have to uh, talk about it uh, and they're going to have to understand it. Amazing, you you bring in the uh, indigenous people. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. What what are we doing in terms of 
helping the communities. I mean, okay, great. We put in you know, an orange shirt and we understood that there's something to do, you. but it's like, okay, and, and if I'm correct, I think the prime minister who was a huge advocate for it ended up going to BC on a trip yeah, during this that time is, period. I mean, this is where I think, you know, I, this, is where I, this is where people shake their heads at, at politicians, and I'll, I will add my, my head shaking to, uh, to the chorus. Um, you're right. We can put on an orange shirt or we could change our, our Facebook uh, you know, status, frame right. or status right. or put an orange square down or put shoes outside. But at the end of the day, there are communities that are not that far away from here yeah. that don't have clean drinking water. Now, I'll ask you this. Imagine they didn't have clean drinking water in Thornhill. Yeah. Right? They would fix this tomorrow. Yeah. And it wouldn't matter how much it costed. And that's, you know, that's something that people should think about. We should, we should come up with an action plan. And we do have one. And, and conservatives are, are a bit more realistic about the action plan when it comes to Canadian indi- and, and, and Indigenous relations, um, where we pick out some issues and we actually fix this. Enough with the lip service. Instead, we have a prime minister that went surfing on the first national day of reconciliation so that tells you everything you need to know about what the government thinks about this relationship speaking of the government um i th- personally think that we handled um, the COVID situation awful yeah and i still think we do uh in many ways but uh, tell me what you're tell me what you're hearing from you know from from your viewers. well f- forget about it i mean i have the internet right so i could see <laughs> when vaccines arrive to places like israel for sure right i could see when we're receiving them I, I could see that the booster shots are nowhere nowhere near for those that actually want it yeah um you know here you are trying to get people to get the first and second well i want to go on a trip somewhere they're expecting me to have a booster so i'm by the time i get this booster i'm going to need another booster and when is that going to come about and just every uh again in terms of how much money we're getting from the government to help us out uh how you know the information like right now people are looking forward to march you know they they told us that in march it's going to be great and you know we're going to go back to the way we were uh we're still wearing masks everywhere i mean right. I, I, I i see Things changing in the United States, you know, our, our neighboring country who are very much alike. And then I'm from Israel and I see what's happening in Israel. And I'm like, who's the first world country? And it just seems that even when I speak to people from the States or from Israel and I keep getting like, is your country backwards? Like, are you no longer the, the place you used to be? And let's be honest, many people in the last two years have left Canada to move down south to either right. Florida, Costa Rica or wherever it is. I mean, I, I plan to also, but... The reality is Don't go. We need we need uh, human ingenuity here. I will, I will still uh, I will still do stuff on the internet, so it's all good. <laughs> uh, no, but the reality is it's it's we're we're seeing people who are fed up with the way we're moving, and the COVID I think kind of showed how dumb we can be and how slow we can be and how this government is a little bit uh, out of out of whack or yeah, out of place. Look, I, you know, I, I have to agree with you and I've been vocal about it. I, I think particularly on, uh, on our procurement of the vaccines, I know we were, you know, we were slow and now we're talking about getting that, you know, that last percent to, to, to take up the, the, the vaccines, but we are, we were behind. And I think the reason that we struggled, a big part of the reason why we struggled with a fourth wave or even a third wave is that we were behind. Um, right. and I talk to the same people as you do both in the States. I have, a, you know, I have a number of, number of friend groups who have decided to go to Florida and for a number of reasons not only COVID I think COVID pushed them was that, was yeah well he's, he's, he certainly won he certainly um, but it's not only you know it wasn't only the COVID situation I think that COVID pushed them over the edge but it's the things that we talked about before we talked about uh, you know the price of housing in, 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 in Ben's case I'm sure it's the, the price of day school um, that is just it's easier to get by and then of course th- all of the you know all of the things that uh, that Florida brings it's sunshine and lower taxes right. um, we you know we, we have to be able to compete to keep talent here Uh, and COVID is one of them and I you know I tend to agree with you in terms of you know we don't have this right yet Um, we don't have travel right yet Uh, I think there is a lot of mix between what uh, what's going on in in the province and the the restrictions and the passports and um, and all of those and then what's going on from a federal level and that's you know vaccination of the public service and our travel guidelines and you know it's not it's not the same everywhere and it's not the same everywhere in the world so it's tough to uh, tough to understand my office is 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 a place that gets a lot of questions about can I go here what do I need um, and you're right that uh, people are starting to expect they're, they're moving on to their six months of uh, you know of immunity of when maybe their second vaccine becomes less uh, uh, you know it works less I'm not a doctor but it uh, it sort of wanes in terms of its efficacy 
uh, and they're expecting a, a, a booster. And I know now that we're, you know, we're starting with boosters for those that are that are older and uh, and and immunocompromised. But we're nowhere near the kind of rollout uh, that we were at. And you know, I hope and and what I'll do is I'll make sure uh, that I'm vocal about our uh, our procurement about uh, getting that third dose. So we're you know we're right in line and we can. We can have a normal year next year. I, I know we just talked about being behind the eight ball when it comes to this, but uh, accountability yeah. is a word I like to use. And I like, you know, when I teach as a teacher, I always say, you know, you need to be accountable for your actions. I didn't hear any accountability by our government for everything that they screwed up. I've heard, you know, how to fix certain things, that, sure. but I never heard accountability. I heard a lot of victory laps more than more than accountability. Well, I don't, I don't know if I paid attention too much to the victory laps because I, I yet to hear, I hear yet to hear people celebrating, but accountability, like meaning people taking real responsibility and saying, look, because like I, I don't know if people are realizing it, like uh, the credit cards company are calling everyone these yeah. days. Like I, 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 every time we have a conversation, there's somebody, some credit card company calling. You know, saying it by the way, Absolutely. and it's and sort of everyone's trying to collect, and it's like collecting from, from what? Where, where do you want? Where do you want us to pay? Are you serious with me right now? Like even I, I told you this before, I had a studio, and uh, they were still collecting for six months, even though they knew, and I could not have one guest to come on the show. Nobody cared. Right. So let's talk about the government. Where are? When are they going to come out and say we're accountable for our actions and those people that lost their businesses? Those people that don't have money to eat, money to eat. We're, we're talking about people who are struggling paycheck to paycheck uh, that were, were in a pretty good position just uh, two years ago. What are we doing in order to help these yeah, people? Yeah, and I think you're talking a lot about what comes next. Um, and that's exactly what uh, what the government needs to be held uh, to account for. Uh, and I think that the, the economic... Um, Frankly, I would call it a crisis that we're moving into. It is a into. crisis, definitely. Uh, we've got a, we've already got a cost of living crisis, and uh, you know we've got we've got employers that can't find employees. We've got people that uh, you know that can't find work. We've got uh, we've got jobs to fill. We've got less immigration than we'd have last time. We've got rising housing prices. Uh, you know, corporate, uh, you know, corporate office space that is that is hollowed out in some of our city centers. We've got a major, major crisis on our hands. And I think there needs to be some kind of realization that we're going to have to live with some form of, you know, COVID-19, COVID-20, COVID-21. It's going to be here for a while. So we're not we're not at the at the stage where we've got to eradicate this to zero because I, I don't think we can. I'm not, I'm not right. a doctor, but everything suggests that uh, that we can't. And we've got to move on and we've got to move on and focus on uh, on the economy. Hold those in government to account. Um, you know, ask the tough questions and make sure that the policies that they're putting forward are better than the ones that they started with. And that's exactly my job as, a, as, an, as an opposition member, to make sure that anything that the government introduces, that we can make it better for people. What I'm noticing, though, is that um, they're not helping regular people. And what I mean by regular people, I'm, I'm going to rephrase myself because that's not what I want to say. I want to say the middle class. I feel like there is a big help to the lower class, and then there's big help to the upper class. And what happens is it wipes the middle class. That's right. And either brings you down where now you need, now you owe the government, right? Because that's what they want you. I mean, you owe, yeah. you owe credit card companies, you know, like you're now in debt to them. So what I'm noticing is that there's going to be a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger gap. And I don't even know what plan they have forth to fix that because everything they're doing right now is taking away that money now, you know, the extra money from people who are saying, well, you can't work. Well, go get vaccinated. You'll, you'll get a job. It's like, well, you know, again, it's my body. It's my choice. Well, we're not here to help you until you abide by our rules. That's when we can help you out. So where do you see the middle class in the next four years? Look, I, I think you're I think you're right. And I think any government's goal should be to expand the middle class is to make as many people, you know, uh, who are who are who are frankly working to join the middle class, right. be able to join the middle class, right? So, less, you know, less disparity between, you know, those who don't find themselves in the quote unquote middle class. And I don't know how to how to necessarily define that, but I can, you know, I can take a hint from uh, from from we we represent a community that is very middle class. Yeah. Um. You know, where where many many people, and this is this is. This is something that is particular to, to, to Thornhill and some of the writings around it. Um, you know, my parents came here from, from the Soviet Union, um, just like y y yours did. And, and they, came, they came kind of early. 
uh, and they didn't have the fancy financial advisors right. and 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 everything that you know that we possibly could have um, today. And their savings happens to be, you know, dumped in the equity in their homes, mm-hmm. right? So they bought this home in Thornhill. It was you know it was cheap cheaper not cheap at the time uh and now you know it's somewhere in the you know in the million to two million dollar range that's their that's a retirement plan right they don't have you know fancy most people don't have fancy rsps and savings plans like my dad drove a cab until he didn't have to drive a cab anymore Mm -hmm. like this guy wasn't saving you know saving cash he dumped everything he had into a home and so what we have is we've got people living longer with retirements that are saved up in their house, not being able to, to, to help their kids, of course there's an erosion of the middle class. Everything your parents built was to try to you know, help you to have a, a, a good life. But they're living longer. They don't have the cash to, uh, uh, you know, to, to stretch. And as a result, you, know, you might fall under where, where they started from. And that wasn't the point of coming to Canada. Right. And so we've got to show people that one, that this is the best country in the world and you can do whatever you want to do. The two, we bring people who are, you know, economic immigrants who are there to fill some of the labor force needs. Mm-hmm. And we've got to get people back to work. And CERB is, is one of those things that have stopped people um, from necessarily working. We've got to get over, you know, I think the, the fear in, in society about this pandemic. And uh, eventually the benefits do have to wane so, so, so employers can start filling their rosters with, it, with employees that work. We need to provide people with more paychecks, bigger paychecks, and frankly, stop spending in this country so, it, our, taxes con- so our taxes don't continue to rise uh, and that we're not in debt. Like our grandchildren's grandchildren, grandchildren are now going to pay for what just happened this, these last 18 months. Well, I'm going to make it a little bit personal about something. Yeah. But um, and there's a little bit of a difference between your father coming here, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, people could live in an apartment, sure. you know, with like, uh, three kids, you know, two bedrooms, you know, let them play. But today we, we don't have it. Like every, if your house, the whole doesn't have like two laptops and you know, like you got to have what everybody else has that were, you know, back in the day, if you had one car for the family it was fine today, we were kind of been spoiled. But at the same time, you're talking about your dad being a cab driver and able to save money, like equity, to have a house. Yeah. Um, yeah, you I'm can't gonna, do that. I'm going to make it personal. I have three jobs. I teach at two different schools, and I have my own tutoring company, and I can barely get, I can barely For sure. save anything. And with an education, with everything, and I'll, I'll share something very short just to kind of put things in perspective. Uh, it's not the same in Toronto, so I'm just going to say something. So when I lived in New York... I lived on one side of the street, and it cost uh, $2,500 to rent the place. On the other side of the street was a low-income place. The exact same building looks identical on the inside. I have been there. They're paying $600 for the same apartment, and they're getting benefits while sitting at home. Well, after I finish my work, and I work five days a week or six days a week that I work there, at the end of the day, we're at the same place. But I am working triple the time, working really hard to just get there. So my question is, really, where are we going with this where people like myself who are willing to go out to yep. work, who are getting vaccinated, who are out there trying to you know, make every buck possible, even having the show, we got to spend the money in order to make money. Where is the money coming from? Who is helping our side? Yeah, look, I, I think you're I think you're exactly right. And this is what we talk about. We, we talk about, you know, people coming into the labor force in 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 in, in the jobs that they can and, and, and want to do. Uh, bigger paychecks and again less government spending is is not going to allow for people to you know sit at home and and kind of do nothing and I say that in 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 jest because I'm I'm not sure that that's the that's the circumstance and I will say that I don't think it was easier for for people like my parents to to come here I think maybe they needed a less of a down payment but remember they left a country where uh, you know, in my case, they were they were oppressed. Yeah. Uh, uh, they came here with with no language. Uh, you know, my dad was an engineer, not a cab driver. Yeah. But he, you know, he did what he had to do so my mom could uh, go to school. Uh, and you every know, Russian's yeah, an engineer. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. Though, so. I, you know, I just I don't understand why more more of us aren't good at math. But, yeah. but, um, but in terms of. You know, in terms of, of, of what they had to, to sacrifice, and things were hard then too. They, we had an, you know, they had an 18% uh, 
uh, you know, interest on uh, on their mortgage. We wouldn't dream of that. We, you're, you're you're printing money. You're borrowing it cheap now. Um, so of course the the prices are are high. So you know, I, I don't give them a the a, a free pass, but I get it. It's it's no, but I, it's I, difficult. I, I don't mean it like that. Like I, I didn't mean to downplay you know the job, but at the same time, like people were very comfortable living. Like sure. I have a friend who moved from one place to another, and he said, oh, uh, the house was a little bit too small for us. And I was like, but but you really can't afford to buy the next house. Like, right. why are you doing it at all? Because the market's going to change, and I have to kind of figure something out. And it's like, we lived in an apartment. You know, yeah. me and my sister shared a room. Like, what's happening? And these days, you just you just don't do it. Right, and I, I think that this is this is why they came here. They came here to, to, to achieve better. Like, you know. But it's, is it it's, better? It's, it's, well, I mean, I think... You know, I think in 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 that case, I I was able to, you know, we have we have some of the best public schools in the country, uh, you know, right near in Thornhill. So you could have you could have done that. I went to you know one of the best universities, um, in uh, in the country. Uh, you know, my parents made sacrifices so that I can you know can sit at a boardroom table, so I can you know I can have a a, a C suite title, um, so I can be a parliamentarian right. in one in one generation, and that's exactly. You know, that's exactly what I go to to Ottawa with, knowing that that experience is different. Look, I'm, I'm a bit younger than uh, than my brother. I was the first kid born here. I never, you know, I never shared a shared a, a bedroom or, or even lived at, you know, 60, 40 like everybody else on. Uh, on, on, on TVs <laughs> yeah, represent. exactly. On yeah. bathers. Um, I was, you know, I was I was lucky enough that my parents were further enough along that they were, you know, they were in Thornhill by the time I was, you know, I was I was still in diapers. Um, but for 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 me, I know those experiences. I grew up with them. It wasn't easy. I know that it wasn't it wasn't easy every single month putting putting food on the table, and that's exactly what we're facing now. So if we want to tell people that uh, you know coming to Canada is going to give you the best life possible, then I'm sure as heck going to make sure that that's the case when I'm speaking up in Ottawa, holding this government to account, stopping them from printing money, stop of them from stopping them from racking up debt, and stopping them from from having you know people pay uh, uh, exorbitant tax uh, tax rates so that they don't take their money home and they don't make the decisions about what to spend their money on. The best person to make decisions about what you spend money on is you, not the government. I love your answers. I love where you're going with this. I, I want to ask you just one more thing before I really talk about you. Cause yeah. I brought up a lot of things uh, that's unrelated to you, but more related to, of course. So now we're going to go into who you're present. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to go into it. But before I do that, there's a question that I kept receiving, and I figured this was the perfect opportunity to ask. There are some people out there that are saying Canada first. And by that means that, you know, we should take care of our own people that have, you know, been here for a very long time and paid their taxes and paid their dues. And there's many immigrants who are coming into the country as refugees and who are getting a lot more than the Canadian who has been at work here for 20 years, you know, worked his butt off to be able to raise his kids. Yep. And he is stuck in a little home. And we're talking about white privilege. We're talking about all these empty words, in my opinion, uh, where we're forgetting about, you know, your regular Canadian. Like we're putting other people first. Is this something that you're seeing, something that you're hearing? Yeah, look, when I when I when I talk when when you talk about Canada first, I think immigration reform. Um, and look, I'm from an immigrant family. You're from an immigrant right. family. Most people that we know, yep. you know, came to to this country because of the generosity of this country. Right. Absolutely. And we worked hard and 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 all of that. And by yep. we, I mean my parents. Um, but I think that we need to look at the system of immigration. We need to be bringing in more economic immigrants. That means people that are that are. Uh, uh, you know that are linked to our labor force needs. Right. So we have we have jobs that we need to fill. We've got immigrants that want to come to this country because believe me, people want to come to Canada. Oh, there's it's the no question. Best there's place no in the no world question. to live. Um, so we we need to be better at that. I think when the government sponsors refugees, I think that they are um, that they are be, you know that they rely on government for longer. I think private sponsorship to uh, to refugees is is one of the answers. We saw during the Syrian crisis, you know, the churches and the synagogues and and everybody that was sponsoring, um, you know, Syrian refugees. I had a number that I met on my own campaign team. You know, three guys, young guys that came here. Uh, you know, two own an HVAC company right now, and one's in the jewelry business. And mm. this is, you know, this is 
a couple years after they came, right. working hard. And that was private sponsorship of, uh, of, of refugees coming to this Canada to create a better life. And those are the things that we need to talk about when we talk about, you know, whether it's, it's not, it's not Canada first, it's, are we taking in, um, you know, the right mix of people to make it work for us here? Um, right, and my parents were part of that right mix of people. Uh, and I'm with you on this. And uh, by the way, uh, at no point in time, I take talking about taking money away from people who yeah, of course. You know, come to this country. Like, uh, you know, I, I wish my parents had more support when they came here. They, they struggled. So I'm not here to take food off of other people's plate. But uh, when I say Canada first, I mean like the Canadians who work really hard, like uh, – I'll just I won't talk about something personal, but there's people who are uh, being forced into retirement these days. There are sure. people who are sort of like not receiving their gold watch mm-hmm. at the end of the retirement. There's and a saying, gold watch at the end of this? Uh, apparently they're supposed to be. Isn't that something that we learned That's while watching awesome. Hollywood stuff? <laughs> right. But it's it's people who are not being treated, um, you know, for the time that they've put in. And yet you have people coming from other countries. Yes, they do need the help. Yep. But the amount of help that they're receiving in comparison to helping those people at home the difference is night and day. Right. And that's really what I think we should be fighting for is for the Canadians. Now, again, I'm I'm an immigrant, but I'm, I'm talking about people who come and they want to become a part of the country who are, sure. who are not, you know, for five years uh, taking money from the government. Like the minute I had an opportunity, by the way, I took money from the government for three, four months. And right away, I was like, I got to get a job. There's no way I could sit here and do nothing. I'm talking about those that are actually working hard to be rewarded yeah. for what they're doing. And we've got to do better on things like uh, like credentials, right? Like I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, my dad was an engineer who, who ended up being a cab driver. Yeah. He didn't speak English. And there are, you know, how many doctors are, are, are Uber drivers? How many, you know, how many people come over that are nurses that are that are stuck in a, in yeah. a lower level of, you know, PSW care, which Absolutely. doesn't pay as much. Uh, they went to school in their home country. So I think we need to do better on, on recognition. And I think that's, you know, that's changed. And I think we need to allow people to work to the fullest scope of their abilities. And we have that need. Right. You know, that try to find a family doctor in Ontario. Right. It's hard. Tell me um, about and it. And we've got, you know, we've got people that are coming in that are that are trained in their uh, in their, uh, you know, in their home countries. And if we had a bit of an easier process on licensing and they didn't have to go drive a cab or they didn't have to go work at, uh, you know, retail to be able to put food on the on the table, then they wouldn't get stuck in these, you know, in these kind of what I would call like a low level, lo- low level job. So, you know, it's a it's a difference between, you know, it's economic immigration. It's it's private refugee sponsorship. It's uh, it's creating a greater scope for those who come here with the credentials. There is a lot of things we could be doing um, that will solve solve this problem of people saying that uh, you know Canadians are getting shafted but again are, are they going to be getting more money are they going to be getting more support it doesn't seem well like I think if you allow people to 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 come and work in their field um, in the thing that they know right. how to do and give them a, 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 a job I don't think anybody wants to you know get in line right. and wait for a check from uh, from the government there's a there's a lot of pride when you come here from this country but this you know this this country has to be able to afford you the opportunity to do the thing that you want to do and do the thing that we need. And I think that's one of the changes that we need to make. And that's when I, that's why I talk about immigration reform. You talked about pride. I want to get into something personal. Sure. Your parents. Yeah. Must be very proud of you. I, I you know, I, they, they are. I um, I had my swearing in ceremony. I, I saw. Uh, this, uh, this, you didn't bring the mezuzah. I, I did. It's in my pocket. Oh. oh. I did. You brought it. It's in my pocket, which is uh, which is in my jacket outside. But I'll tell you the Mazuza story in a second. Um, but my swearing in. Uh, so my dad was there. I lost my mom, um, you know, a year ago, almost to the day of, of us sitting here right now. So she didn't get to see all this. But I know, I know she knows as this is happening because we've talked about it a lot uh, before I decided to uh, to do this. So my dad was there. My family was there. Um, you know, my closest friends were there. I would have had a thousand people there if I could. Um, cause we just got so much support and so much love in this, uh, in this community. And it was a really special moment where again, like a kid from an immigrant family, um, you know, who came here less than, you know, less than 40 years ago or 45 years ago. Um, the first generation, you know, gets a seat in parliament. That's a really, really special thing that happens in Canada and doesn't happen in a lot of other places. I'm sure they still wanted you to be a lawyer or a doctor. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, it's just like the Jewish she, parents, my, right? my, my dad, you know, I'm sure my dad was <laughs> muttering under his breath. She could have been a good surgeon. Right, right, uh, right. right. And, uh, but, uh, but uh, alas, they got, uh, they got a politician. So here is, um, here's this, um, Here's this mezuzah, and I'll, t- I'll I'll show you why it's why it's. So I'm, you know, I'm. It's no secret that I'm. A, I'm well, should a we tell people I'm what a, a mezuzah Jew. is? Maybe yeah. some people don't so have no idea. Yeah. So this goes. Uh, you know, why don't you explain it? That this. Uh, 
Okay, beautiful. So we put this in a door, and it says, uh, usually, Shin Dalet Yud, which is Shomer Dlatot Israel, keeper of the doors of Israel. And we put this, and if for those that uh, know anything about Passover, has a lot relating to Passover, where God sort of, or the angel of death kind of passed over Jewish houses that had blood. And this is something that we are told to put, and there's a uh, scroll, scroll inside uh, that has Shema Israel and uh, keeper of the house. That's right. So... So this is going on the door of uh, the Parliament Hill office, and I saw I started this conversation by saying that this is not, you know, this is not my seat. This is Thornhill's seat, and this is Thornhill's office, uh, and this be- office belongs to the people of Thornhill. Um, and so for me, um, I'm going to put this on the door on Parliament Hill. And another, so I got this from our former MP um, at, you know, at a dinner that we, a little dinner that we had after the swearing in, and uh, Peter Kent um, gave this to me, and it's made from. Um, you know, from from the Iron Dome, which is Israel's missile defense um, technology that uh, that has saved countless Israeli lives um, and is the you know is the key. And I, I hope that it keeps our you know our office safe. And I hope that it reminds me every day, um, you know, that I am not only there for the people of Thornhill. I'm there for 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 the for for my people, for for the Jewish people, for the for the community. Um, and I hope that it protects us. And it was given to him by a guy named Rabbi Balka, and he was known as Canada's uh, rabbi. He passed away just, just recently, um, uh, you know, untimely. Oh, yeah. And, um, and uh, he gave this to Peter. But uh, So I hope that it's, it sits on the, on the door to the office of the Member of Parliament for Thornhill for, for many, many years. I hope that I, that I get to sit in that office too. But I hope well after me, whoever gets it, we will pass that on to them. And I hope that it remains a tradition um, to have a mezuzah on the on the door of uh, of the office for the member of parliament for Thornhill. So that's well. A, that's the a first thing story. is the tradition is that if you know that a Jewish person is going to be moving into right. office, hopefully there will be somebody. You're not allowed to take it off. That's so right. You have to keep that's it right. There. So hopefully, hopefully that's that's. But it doesn't way. have to be. It doesn't have to be Jew. It just right. has to be. It just has <laughs> to be a supporter of the cause. Uh, what I want to you you got a little bit of a clamped. Uh, for a moment, when you mentioned the community, you mentioned Peter Kent. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned. I don't know. There was. It, it felt like when you were holding this, it was sort of like a baton that was kind of passed yeah. on to you, and it kind of has this baton look. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that feeling of 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 actually sitting there and and making those changes. And you know, as I said, like I remember you in university. And I remember. Uh, that you were running after things all the time. Right. You were I wasn't friends. going to very much class, so. Yeah, neither neither was I. <laughs> I was watching you. Uh, but the reality is, you're now there. Yeah. Um, so I've got to like I've got to make it count, and I have the benefit of having such a fortunate um, relationship with P- with Peter. I've known him almost since I was a kid, since before he ran in uh, in Thornhill, and when he did decide to run in Thornhill. You know, my parents, they're not the fundraising type because we didn't come from the fundraising type of community, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. they were friend raisers. Mm-hmm. So it was like, invite every Russian you know to the backyard and make a hamburger. So mm-hmm. I told my mom we were having a little barbecue, and it ended up being 130 people. And it was for both uh, Peter Kent people and Peter love Sherman. Barbecue. People love barbecue, mm-hmm. and people love lots of salads. So, um, no so shashlik? We ca- <laughs> no, uh. <laughs> well, it was just, it was, it, was, it was too many people for that. But, um, but Peter came, and so I've known him for a long time, and it, it was this passing of this like almost friendly incumbency and he didn't have to do any of that he didn't have to knock on doors and he didn't have to be there every day and he didn't have to come to my swearing in and he didn't have to give me this and he didn't have to be such a mensch for 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 the community but he was um and i hope that we honor him in a real way um you know when covid is 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 behind us or yeah. or at least we've you know we've decided that it's behind us um and i hope that the community does something really special for a man that o- always stood up, even when it wasn't popular. And it's true. I mean, I, I have watched Peter since he came into office. Actually, he was in 2007 before he was running. Uh, I had him in my movie premiere that I did, and he came as one of my guest speakers. Uh, and we were all saying, you're going to be the next uh, MP of Thornhill, yeah. and that happened. I, I, I believe that one of your very close friends or roommates was also uh, his campaign manager yeah. at the time. Right? I yeah. remember them walking around in the mall. Uh, but the one thing I want to ask you is, um, since you brought up Peter Kent, uh, talk to me a little bit about how you and him got involved. How, because in some ways, I, I may say something, he, he was mentor to you, right? He, yeah, he mentored you bit, from. Yeah, for sure. 
Look, I, I mean, I worked on uh, on his campaign. I worked in, on t- campaigns be, before his, um, and uh, I'd always, you know, like having having Peter Kent as your MP is like it's like winning the lottery, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, he was a he was a good voice, and so I'd always kept in touch with him. I spent a lot of my career in uh, in Ottawa. I, you know, I was fortunate enough to 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 work with Peter. Uh, to work with Prime Minister Harper, to work with our Foreign Affairs Minister, to work with our Finance Minister. I had, you know, sort of that perfect, um, you know, that perfect career um, in Ottawa working for the cause from a number of different uh, facets. And I'd always, you know, I'd always kept in touch. Um, And when it came to, we had a little bit of a nomination in uh, in Thornhill. So when that was all done and we selected a candidate, Peter was on board from, you know, day one. And like I said to you, he didn't have to do any of this. He could have just, like, hung up the skates and just said, yeah, you know what? I'm retiring. But he's not like that. So I'm um, I'm so happy to have a friendly, you know, a friendly incumbent there. Uh, it also helps because we get to take over his office, and uh, we, you know, we get to wor- you know continue those relationships. It's not like we beat out a, 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 a liberal. We just had somebody retire, and the the riding had the good sense of keeping a conservative in there. So right. everything is uh, is a good seamless transition, and allows me to focus on uh, on the things that we uh, that we need to do rather than. Um, all of the sometimes fighting that you would have if you if you beat somebody from another party. We we appreciate you as our leader of Thornhill, uh, and I want to wish you the best of luck. But before I do that, I just like to say a little bit more. Uh, what's your actual end goal? Because to me, it seems like you're someone who's just not looking at Thornhill. You're looking at bigger picture here. Oh, Correct me if question. I'm wrong. That's a good question. But I, I I don't know. But I feel like yeah, I'm, I represent the community, but I represent the greater community, which is. Toronto, which is Canada. Uh, do you have any aspirations to possibly go further? Well, I think that uh, you know that first I will I will learn everything that I need to learn to be a good parliamentarian, and I will always be a good parliamentarian for Thornhill first. The door will always be open. Um, I will always be accessible. I answer my own, uh, and if anybody ever messages me on Facebook, they'll know, and I answer my own Instagram and all of that. Um, so I want to make sure that that uh, is happening. But of course, um, you know, of course I think that I can bring change to this country. Um, and I think that I can be part of uh, a strong team that will, uh, that will change the face of Canada for the better. And uh, my aspirations are to do whatever I can in my power to be part of that change. I would like to leave off with, uh, you know, just maybe a message, sort of like a closing message. And what I mean by that, it's uh, for the next generation. For sure. Because I feel that, you know, speaking to people, you know, who are our age or, you know, uh, you know, they can agree with you, they can follow you. But what is it we want to leave behind in terms of a legacy? Because I'm sure there is something you want to leave behind because you mentioned, you know, what would happen to the grandchildren, you know, where, where are they yeah. going to be? So what is your message to them uh, that you're hoping they're going to get out of you? Because I'm hoping you're going to be there for the next 40 to 50 years. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take it year by year. But I do want people to see the potential in this country. And, uh, you know, I've always said we have enough food to feed the world. We have all of the natural resources we need to power us for, for, for a generation. We've got the best and the brightest and the smartest. And if we have a reason to keep them in Canada and we have a reason to grow this country, we could be a world superpower. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that we're living up to our potential. And I think that if, if, if government allowed people um, to take advantage of everything that we have here, um, and to, to you know to work and raise a family um, and and be the best that they can be. I think we can be a superpower. I applaud you for everything that you do. You're a courageous woman. Uh, oh, there it is. Really it's official. Uh, and by that I mean you've always you've you've always worked really hard to get where you want to get to, and that is something to be commended because not too many people you know just they, many people talk the talk. You walked the walk, and you just said to me before you knocked on seventy-five. Well, 000. I didn't, but I got a lot of help, okay. and our team knocked on. Well, no, your 70, team. I mean, seventy-five thousand. Yeah, that means we 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 probably visited everybody in Thornhill two or three times, sometimes more. As a documentary filmmaker, I uh, noticed that you were documenting, you know, like whenever you had meetings, and whether it was uh, at. Uh, I don't know where you were, like different uh, houses. Yeah. You were in, uh, you were in parks. Uh, 
ho- by hospitals. Like I, I saw you really walking around campaigning. Did you document uh, the, the entire we did, rise we did, to power? We did. So it sounds, sounds kind of weird, but <laughs> we um, we uh, we managed to look. I think that's a big way of communicating with uh, with the public. I think the more people see you, the more people um, can uh, you know can can access you. I was walking around Thornhill Woods today. I went to uh, to a haunted house there, and uh, a couple people came up to me. He's like, "What? You just walk your dog outside?" I'm like. Yeah, don't yeah. you walk your dog outside? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. My dog doesn't walk inside, so yeah. um, so I want to be, you know, I want to be there. I want to be everywhere, um, and I want to know that whatever I'm standing up for in Ottawa is the right thing. So I think being connected to uh, uh, to the community, hearing from them as many times as possible, and uh, and having them, you know, see me in the places that that matter both to them and to me. Um, is important because I think that's uh, that's when you're the best voice. I can vouch for that. Here you are, number one on the show. <laughs> uh, never denied me of anything. Actually, uh, I want to compliment you. You helped me with a big job that I did when I moved to Los Angeles. And uh, if I can do it publicly and say thank you for that. Uh, so you're always uh, a lady of your word, and I really appreciate you, and I, I want you to succeed. Uh, again, I, I want you to succeed as a person. Forget just government. Forget whatever okay. it is that you do, but succeed in everything in life, and I really appreciate you, and I hope that Thornhill uh, appreciates everything that you're doing for them uh, because we got somebody from our community yeah, representing we're just, us. Yeah, we're just getting started, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one final plug. Just Please. follow oh, yeah, you know, yeah. follow the follow the socials. I'm very easy to find online. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Feel free to, uh, to reach out. Feel free to come by. Um, our office um, we are uh, we are at uh, 1118 uh, Center Street uh, unit 23 you can't miss us um, and uh, and always feel like you can call pick up the phone um, or uh, or message we're gonna be there um, to help with uh, with everything that you need and to uh, to hear your concerns Melissa Lensman such a pleasure thank really appreciate having it. me thank you for Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I don't know if we had any questions. Maybe there was something. Maybe there wasn't. But you know what? I think I've asked enough. Uh, Till next week, have yourself an amazing week. Be safe. And remember, show love, no hate. Have a good one. Cheers. This was great.